welcome to the second Sunday in Advent as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Christ in uh, this uh, December. And I uh, got a little bit, I noticed there was light when I came in, but I looked out the window, it looks like it's all gone. So, <laughs> panic averted. I, you know, I, it, before I drove down here, because you know, it's so far from Shanelis to Windlock, I, I checked on the Windlock Facebook group, and the panic was palpable. Oh, don't drive. It's horrible. The roads are so bad. And so, you know, um, luckily over the years of living here, having grown up in Michigan, I realized that your panic and my panic are very different, especially on the Windlock Facebook page. So just... Yeah, it's, it was still it so. But you know, it, oftentimes when we look at what's going on in the world, we can look at things and we automatically go to the worst case scenario. Doesn't matter whether it's snow, it's the news, whatever it is. And the nice thing for me about Advent is it's a good reminder that even in the midst of all those things, God is at work, even if we don't know it. And one of the ways that we mark that is through the Advent wreath. And today, we have lit two candles as we journey on this four weeks toward Christmas. And so as before we get to our confession of forgiveness, I wanted to take a moment just to pray for us as we enter into this second week of Advent. So let us pray. <coughs> Praise to you, O God, who gives us courage to start again. You fasten righteousness around your waist and baptize with the Holy Spirit's fire. Bless us as we mirror your mighty fire in these simple flames, and teach us to mirror your justice in the paths we prepare. We ask that peace abound until none hurt or destroy over all the earth. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for a confession of forgiveness. It's found on page 94 in the front part of your hymn. Gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing our opening hymn, number 641, 641.
let's pray together the prayer of the day as printed in the bulletin. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, nurture our growth as people of repentance and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall raise him. The cow and the bear shall graze, their younger shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son.
Please stand as we welcome the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the third chapter. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So stoles, these things that pastors wear in the Lutheran tradition, are important. They're an important part of our kind of uniform, you should say. And the reality is, these things are not cheap. Any of you that have been through graduate school, which seminary is, know that at the point of getting close to graduation from graduate school, you have oodles of cash, right? <laughs> no. So I was coming to, with the, I think it was January of my last year of seminary, and I was starting to think about where am I going to get stoles? And how am I going to afford them? Well, my parents had said they were going to buy me a red one for ordination, which was a great gift. I mean, it was a wonderful, you know, and, and, I, and I love my red stole because of that. It's one that my parents bought for me and, and one that I, I treasure. But that's still left the rest of the church here, right? I mean, we have that whole time that's green, you know, and you got to have a white one. You have a blue one, you have a purple one. What am I going to do? And I'm looking, and these things are seriously expensive. So I get this phone call. I get this phone call from a pastor in Dubuque, Iowa, who apparently had noticed me. I had no idea who this man was. None. He said, I have a friend who just died. He was a pastor. I want to keep his red stole because that's just an important important for me. But one of his wishes was that his collection of stoles go to a seminary graduate who needs it. Would you happen to need a set of stoles? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So most of my stoles are from a pastor who gave them to me after his death. And, and there is a treasure to those thinking that those have gone through that person's time of proclaiming the gospel and now have gone through my, you know, we're 
17 years of proclaiming the gospel. But there's another soul in my collection that is very special to me, and it's this one. Of course, it's Advent, so there's, what, four weeks a year you get to wear it. But this soul was made by my home congregation and they sent it to me, unknown to me. They just sent it in a package, UPS, on the fifth anniversary of my ordination. I get this envelope for my home congregation, and I open it up, and here's the skull. And it has a name. It's called Journey to Bethlehem. And you, know, you can kind of see the path, right, going through up to the star. But it isn't just about the design of the Soul. Journey to Bethlehem has a special place in my home congregation. So the pastor, when I was in high school, Pastor Terry, wrote a Christmas Advent production, and he called it Journey to Bethlehem. And my home congregation had this huge area of property that they had built a retirement community on, and it was a big field, and then there was a church and the parking lot. So, journey to Bethlehem started inside. You would go through, and there'd be stations, and you'd hear the different stories. Simeon and Anna, you'd hear about how Mary found out she was going to be pregnant. And then you would get to the outside, and your shepherd guides, we called them, would say, Now be careful. We are about to embark on the most dangerous part of our journey out toward Bethlehem. Be careful. There are soldiers throughout the trip. I got to play a soldier. <laughs> High school and college, I played a soldier. It was so much fun. So the first year, I mean, it, it, this, so the first year, this is awesome, right? So there's this, it's probably... 150 yards, 200 yards between the church and out to the retirement community. It's dark, it's December, it's cold, and all you see are these fire pits, right? That's all people see, and these shadows. The local university let us borrow these helmets that looked like Roman soldier helmets, and the first year we had these metal swords. I kid you not, they were like four or five feet long, <laughs> maybe six feet long metal. And every time we noticed that the door opened, we would start clanking them. And they were loud. And we were cold. We were cooking venison. We were, we had tents. And then when the groups would come up, we would take one of the shepherd guides and we'd be like, that one looks a little shifty, and we grab them and roughly throw them behind the tent. I mean, the people were crying. Why do I tell you all this? Because Christmas has become cute. Let's be honest, right? We are all about a cute little baby that was born. We are about our cute little Christmas programs. We want to sing our beautiful Christmas songs. But let's be honest. That first Christmas was not cute, was not beautiful, and people were scared. Mary and Joseph had to be scared out of their mind, traveling to Bethlehem, not knowing what was going to happen. I mean, those of you here who have carried a baby, actually, especially your first one, right? You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's happening. Your body is doing things that are amazing, but holy cow, this is crazy. And Mary's like 13 years old, and it's her first baby, and she's traveling, and there's these, and there's this, you know, this, this, the census, and there's got to be, you know, people running around, and I just, it, it had to be horrible.
just like in a, in a few months when we get ready to celebrate Easter, one of the most important parts of getting to Easter is the journey of Lent to get there. And I think one of the most important parts for us as we think about getting to Christmas in a couple short weeks is this journey to get there, this time of Advent. You know, in some ways we are like we are like five-year-olds looking at all the presents under the tree and trying to figure out, could I unwrap them and see the gift and get it wrapped up so mom and dad could figure it out? <laughs> right? We want to unwrap that gift. But first, I think we need to hear John the Baptist. First, we need to go on the journey. John the Baptist making the way for the Lord, the voice crying in the wilderness, the wilderness of our real life, the wilderness of the times when we feel like nothing is going right, like everything is hopeless, like every time we, we open our computer or turn on the news, something bad has happened, just like for Mary and Joseph just like in that time for the people of Israel whose land is not their own, who are under Roman occupation, who are struggling not only under rulers who are foreign, but also under rulers who are their kinfolk, but are working for these people. For folks like Mary and Joseph, it was probably feeling pretty hopeless. <clears throat> And yet, God intervened. God is there. And if we stay in the journey for a moment and spend some time with John the Baptist, we realize that yes, soon God actually comes into this world as a baby, but God was still acting before that. God is acting through John the Baptist, proclaiming the truth of God's forgiveness, proclaiming the truth also that God wasn't really happy with what was happening, right? That was when the Pharisees and Sadducees show up, the ones who are in cahoots, the ones who are making life miserable for the faithful. And John the Baptist points it out and says, this isn't right. This repentance is for you too. This repentance is for me too. Because at the end of the day, when I really start to think about it, who did John the Baptist save his wrath for? It wasn't the people coming to him humbly in repentance. It was for the church leaders who today would be wearing the pretty blue stole. It was a reminder to those of us who are in the family of God that once we're there, our journey is not over. That once we are a part of this family, we continue to need to come to God in repentance or forgiveness. That we continually need to be reminded that while we're here in the family of God, we weren't always here and there was a journey to get here. Whatever that looked like, whether that journey was hard with lots of detours or was a nice straight path where it always just seemed to go right to God. We haven't always been where we are. And there's always someplace else we need to go. Wasn't a theology book, not a book I can even tell you the name of in public. So if you want to know what book my son and I were reading together, you'll have to ask me privately. But the author had a very good statement that I think sums up what it means for us to be people on the journey toward Christmas. He said, life is not about getting to the solution to a problem. 
Life is about solving your current problems so tomorrow you can have more and more complicated problems. <laughs> is that the truest statement you've ever heard? <laughs> And that's what the journey to Bethlehem is about. That's what John the Baptist is about. That's what it means for us to journey toward the manger and ultimately the cross. We are journeying with God, solving the current problems, knowing in this life tomorrow's going to bring just more and more complicated problems. But thanks be to God. Whether God shows up as a baby in a manger or as a weirdly dressed guy in the wilderness preaching the truth, God is there. That is the promise of Christmas. It's not the destination, it's the journey. And we journey together as people of God. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our hymn number 248, number 248. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. God, you renew the church in every age. We give thanks for hymn writers and theologians, inspired teachers, writers, and musicians to delight and instruct your people. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us a vision of creation and harmony, when hurting and destruction will be no more. Teach us to be stewards of the earth and companions to its creatures. Restore to balance and wholeness what human greed has harmed. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You defend the cause of all who are poor and oppressed. Raise up leaders who will govern with equity and serve the common good. Guide judges, lawmakers, and public officials Protect the rights of those who cannot advocate for themselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You deliver those in need from suffering and fear. Come to the aid of any who are exploited or abused, especially children, elders, and victims of human trafficking. Provide safety and help to our neighbors without shelter, 
refugees, and those fleeing violence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You urge your people to welcome one another as you have welcomed us. Nurture ministries of hospitality and care in this and every congregation, especially for the mobile meals. We pray for people who are homebound, hospitalized, or separated from loved ones. We pray especially for Marge and Simon, for Beverly and Mary, Jenny and Karen, June, Robert, Edie and Kim, Tristan, Tristan and Brad, and all those we name before you silently and aloud. God, in your mercy, Amen. you embrace all who have died, trusting your promises, and we give thanks for their faithful witness. Sustain us in hope until we are united with them in the joy of your eternal presence. God, in your mercy, Amen. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share the peace of Christ with one another. I invite you to be seated as we receive our tithes and offerings.
Please stand as you are able as we celebrate Christ's presence in the bread and cup. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he gave it thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I am the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to come and experience the presence of Christ in the bread and cup at the Lord's table. The center ring of glasses is grape juice. The outer rings are wine. Gluten-free bread is available, just ask. But please come. Come and experience Christ's presence in the midst of this sacrament. Ushers will guide you to come forward to kneel as you're able at the rail. All is ready. Please come. The congregation may be seated.
now in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. We come to um, our time of remembering uh, milestones and birthdays. So do we have any of those today? Signora has a birthday. Happy birthday. Anyone else? I invite you to 
stand as you are able as we hear God's word of blessing and, and uh, sing our praise. God, the eternal word who dwells with us in Jesus, who holds us in the grace of the Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We sing our sending hymn soon and very soon, number 439, number 439. Go in peace, let your light shine in love and service. Amen.